quick announcement right before we start. Cobble Fest registration is going much more quickly than we expected. Over half of the spots are already taken. So don't send me nasty emails about not being able to get in because you waited too late to register. It seems like we underestimated the appeal of an all-inclusive resort on the beach in Cabo in January. You should be able to register at least for the next few weeks, but I have no idea if there's going to be any spots left a couple months from now. So go to CaboFest2017.com and come hang out with Haney, Mike, Jacob, Stone, John Greenwood, Rob Rogers, and Salim. As Rob and Salim are also putting on a teaching course two days prior to the Ultra Resuscitation course. Tons of options and opportunity to really expand this to a full week of education slash vacation on the beach. Remember, super kid and family friendly place. Bring the whole crew. It's going to be phenomenal. Now, enjoy the learning. If you're not good enough at ultrasound, that's not an excuse to punish your patients with radiation. Get out there, ultrasounds, hearts, lungs, my VCs. Let us know how you feel about it. Uh, he's slightly intoxicated. You know, got his wrist pain by, by doing over aggressive high fives to his buddies. <laughs> <laughs> and we're back. Strong as a strong intro. Jacob. Yes, Matt. We've gotten a lot of feedback since the first two Long Old Sound podcasts. Mostly bad. Some people have said top 50, 60 podcasts. How many podcasts done. have you done so far? At least 70. All right, so, that's good. That's good. It's like, a, it's, it's, a, it's up there. It's not last. No, not, not the worst ever. Last half full. Um, now, for the people who have not heard the first couple of podcasts, first off, Go back, listen to those. But just as a refresher, tell me why I need to learn how to ultrasound the lungs. I mean, you, you listen to the lungs, you get a chest x-ray when somebody's short of breath. Yeah, that's, that's the way some people do it. You get your answer. Yeah, I mean, that's actually a really good question, Matt. Um, now, uh, Jacob, sorry to interrupt. Wh- why do we look so different? Uh, what do you mean? We actually look exactly the same as we did before. Is it because someone totally screwed up the recording and now we have to re-record it at Smack in Dublin? Yes. All right. So moving on. Um, so why do we have to do this? Now we have our history. We have our physical exam. I mean, that's the stuff we learned in med school. We learned this in residency. But when you actually look at the data, it doesn't do all that great. Now here's a study that was done in Switzerland. And what they did is they looked at 243 patients that were evaluated by residents in the emergency department. And what they did was these are patients with respiratory complaints and they got a history and they got, uh, they did a physical exam. They did auscultation. Now, how good do you think they did? I mean, this is what we do. A patient comes in short of breath. This is what we were taught in medical school and mm-hmm. residency. I mm-hmm. mean, the history is pretty good. I'd say the history alone, they're going to be, I don't know, 70 80%. When you add the physical exam and auscultation, it's going to be better. I don't know the exact number, but it's going to be pretty good. Sure. Yeah, yeah. And that's what I think most of us think. But this study demonstrated that just the history by itself is only 41% accurate. And then when you added auscultation, it was 40% instead of 41. So it actually went down a little bit when you added the physical exam. So you're telling me I'm harming my patients by doing a physical exam? Well, if by harm you mean you're less accurate than a coin flip, then yes, that's right. But it, I mean, this is, it didn't actually go down, but it didn't help at all. That sounds crazy to me. Well, you know, I, I think that we definitely shouldn't just discard the history and physical exam, but you have to know the limitations. And there are studies like this that show that it is very inadequate um, and not accurate at all um, for helping you out. So if you have a history, you have a physical exam, and you get an answer, I wouldn't always depend on that answer. But, but that being said, if a patient comes in with a giant flail chest, I mean, physical exam probably is going to demonstrate rib fractures on that side. Um, so you got to take a look at your salt, but in this ER study in Switzerland showed that the history and the auscultation were worse than a coin flip. And to be fair, there are studies that show auscultation is better than that, but this definitely should give us pause. We definitely need to be realistic about how much we hang our hat on the physical exam. Agree. So let's do a quick recap. We are talking about pleural effusions. We're going to talk about pneumonia today. But before that, we talked about a couple of other things. We talked about these guys right here. Now, Matt, quick question. What is this guy right here? That's a plural line. Awesome. What's this right here? An A line. Okay. What does A line stand for? Um, is it awesome or is it a V? It's no, the, it's, it's the, the awesome Avila sign. Air. Oh, uh, air. A okay. Air. That's probably better. Yeah. And uh, so we see that in normal lung, right? But when else will we see this? I'm assuming when there's air there. I mean that, yeah, I guess that makes sense. I mean, that's like that's, a pneumothorax. It's a pneumothorax because that's predominantly air in the thorax, also obstructive airways disease and normal lungs. So asthma. Kind of, asthma. 
it's kind of a pet peeve of mine when people say that A-lines are normal. They don't necessarily mean normal. They just mean predominantly air in the thorax. Now, on the right side of the screen, what are those guys? Those are B-lines. B-lines. They are vertical artifacts. They start at the pleural line, and they move with respiration. And what do they mean? Uh, increased density. Mm, I like that you actually listen to me when I talk. A lot of people will say this is increased fluid, and it is increased fluid, but you got to think about it a little more broad than that because it can happen anytime that you have increased density, like atelectasis, like a pneumonia, contusions. All of those things can cause increasing B lines. The other thing we talked about are these guys right here. Now, what, what are you? What are we even seeing here? What What is this? I do like how you're taking credit for teaching me what a B line means. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. He said, I like how you listen to me. <laughs> we'll cut this part out. I just, I just want to say it. Well, I, well, I mean, most people most people actually say, like, pulmonary edema. Like, yeah, it means that's, fluid. That's true. It's, it's, it's not true. fluid. It's what yeah, is fluid? It's, true. it's density. I'm joking. Just jokes. Jokes. It's joshing. So what uh, what do we see here, Matt? What is this? <sighs> so um looks like on the right, there's mm -hmm. some sliding or shimmering. Okay. If you like that term. I like better. that. I like that. Now, what does that mean when you see that sliding and that shimmering? It means that the plural lines are together. Nice, nice. So yeah. no pneumothorax. They're touching and sliding back and forth. Correct. So if you see that lung sliding, you've effectively ruled out a pneumothorax in that area you're evaluating. Now, what do you see on the left side of the screen? I see no sliding mm. or shimmering. That's gross. So... If you have a patient, when you have a high pretest probability of that patient having a pneumothorax and you see a lack of lung sliding, you can be fairly confident the patient actually has a pneumothorax. But there are some other causes of the absence of lung sliding besides a pneumothorax. Do you, do you know what any of those are? Mm, things that don't make the pleural line slide. So okay. fibrosis. Nice. Pneumonia. Mm -hmm, pneumonia. What else? So what about like you have a patient with really, really bad asthma. Like you're going to have to intubate that patient bad asthma. What mm. do their lungs sound like? So just no air movement. There's no air movement. They're so obstructed. And if you have that much obstruction, you won't have lung sliding either. And there's been some people that have talked about if you have the patient on too much positive pressure ventilation, you're going to have a diminishing of that lung sliding. If you have a patient that you've just intubated, you know, you may be a little too aggressive, you right main stem and they're still paralyzed, you're not going to see lung sliding on the left, but you'll see the sliding on the right. So you got to kind of think about it in the terms of what's going on with the patient and what they look like in front of you. Now, so it's most commonly a pneumothorax, but really you got to see that lung point. Yes. No, it's pneumothorax. What is a lung point? It's where... The plural line are coming back together, the edge of the pneumothorax. I like it. Yeah, the edge of the pneumothorax. That's right. And is that 100% specific? According to some tiny studies by one Person practitioner. That was yes. an ICU doctor in Europe. Correct. And there have been plenty of case reports of there being false positive, and I've seen a couple of them myself. So they're not 100% specific, the lung point, but very, very highly specific for a lung point. So this week, we're going to talk about pleural effusions and pneumonia. Which one do you want to talk about first? Let's go with pleural fusion. I like it. Now, Matt, how often are you doing percussion? I percuss every single patient I've ever seen until I graduated med school. I see. Yeah, I'm kind of the same way. I'll auscultate here and there, uh, but percussion is not something that I always do, but it's something that we were taught in medical school, taught in residency, maybe some of us, that is important. Now, it doesn't do all that well, actually. Physical exam has been shown to have a sensitivity of 53 to 76%. And in this ICU study, auscultation had a 61% accuracy. So maybe not as useful as we might think. Now, what about the chest x-ray? That's another thing that we get, right? We get chest x-rays when people have respiratory complaints, right, Matt? That we do. Now, there's a couple of different ways you can define how well an x-ray does, and it depends on how you have the patient positioned, which to me is kind of weird. So if you have a supine patient, so laying down flat on their back, sometimes you need as much as 500 cc's to accumulate. That's kind of a lot of fluid. Yeah, no, I think 400 cc's would probably cause some shortness of breath and some issues. And you're sure. telling me you could completely miss that with a supine x-ray. Absolutely. You could put them upright, and upright it's about 130, 140 cc's it can catch. And if you want to be super accurate, you can place the patient in the left or right lateral decubitus, and you can detect as little as 75 cc's of fluid. And that's, that's better, right? But you have to put your patient to a weird decubitus that you have to make sure to shoot the x-ray just perfectly. And I've honestly never ordered this. Have you ever ordered a lateral x-ray? Um, 
I can't think of a specific situation. I bet I have at some point when someone asked me to, but it's not a routine part of my practice for sure. Sure. So let's add ultrasound on there and look at how much better ultrasound does. So ultrasound can detect as little as 20 cc's, and that's reliably detect as little as 20 cc's of pleural effusion. Some studies even say as little as 5 cc's, um, which is significantly better than the best that x-ray can do. And the ultrasound, it's without any kind of special maneuvers. It's just you put the probe there, and you find as little as 20 cc's of fluid. Yeah, so... Th- th- that's a smaller number, so that sounds good. But honestly, why would I care about 20 cc's of fluid? It's a small amount of fluid, right? I mean, 20 cc's of fluid is not necessarily going to cause shortness of breath in your patient. Is, is, that, is that what you're saying? No. I mean, 20 cc's, unless you aspirate 20 cc's, 20 cc's in the actual lung. Yeah. I don't think that's going to cause a problem. No, I, I mean, I actually, I agree with you. But the thing is, is that if we're basing our procedures off of the physical exam, we want the most accurate way to diagnose and to identify where that pleural effusion is if we're going to, you know, puncture it. So this is a study that was done. They had 30 physicians look at 67 patients that needed a tap. And they said, hey, on physical exam, I want you to use your auscultation, use your percussion, use whatever else you need to identify where you would puncture this patient's pleura. And they found out that 15% of the time that it was wrong. Um, Great picture, but I don't understand what you're talking about. What do you mean 15% of the time they're wrong? So basically, if you use the physical exam to identify that spot that you would puncture to get that pleural effusion, 15% of the time you're going to be wrong. So what that means is one out of every six or seven patients that you only use your physical exam, you're going to puncture either the liver or spleen or the lung because you're going to be in the wrong spot 15% of the time. So that's one out of every six or seven. Yeah. And I got to say, if you're doing a thoracentesis and not using ultrasound. I know I'm supposed to be kind of the skeptic here and asking these questions, but I reviewed a case one time where a resident in the hospital did a thoracentesis on a patient and did not use ultrasound, and the patient died because of it. So they'd gotten an x-ray. The x-ray was red as a pleural effusion on the left, but honestly, but actually it was on the right. And so the resident just read the read, went and did it, caused a pneumothorax in a patient that had a huge pleural effusion on the opposite side. It was massive pneumothorax plus pleural effusion, one on each side, patient died. So this is crazy not to use ultrasound if you're going to drain pleural effusions. Yeah, I agree. And that's a, that's a crazy story. And I'm sure that resident was like a really good resident. But the problem is, is that if you don't use ultrasound, you're going to mess up. I mean, one out of in this study, one out of every six, one out of every seven patients that you base it off your physical exam, you are going to puncture something besides the pleura. So it's kind of a big deal. And most of the time, you're actually going to stab the liver. This study showed that 58% of failed thoracentesis actually happened below the diaphragm. And that makes sense because to me, it's very hard to differentiate just with percussion, the difference between the liver, which is full of fluid, and then a pleural effusion, which is fluid. Is that a real picture there you're showing? Oh, yeah, it is. Yeah, these are real pictures uh, that I found on uh, just case reports of pretty bad complications. I mean, here's a, a big core biopsy of the liver. Here, this patient unfortunately had a chest tube go right through his stomach. I mean, it eventually got into the lung, but he went through the stomach first, kind of a big deal. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, whatever else you got to take to get to get success, but, uh, but those look like those are with those big trocars that we used to use, right? That's not going to happen. Well, you're right. The trocar chest tubes are ones where they basically had a huge needle uh, surrounding the chest tube. And we're not going to really see this exact complication anymore. But in these studies, these are people, clinicians who were probably really good clinicians that based their puncture site off that physical exam. And so this is just showing that you're wrong. If you don't use ultrasound, you're going to be in the wrong spot. I mean, look how low this chest tube was placed below the diaphragm. Yeah. And obviously using ultrasound for any procedure, you're not going to completely eliminate the risk. You still may have a bad complication, but I mean, looking, it just, just makes sense. People. I mean, I don't think we need to talk about this a long time. It just makes sense. Looking where you're going here is going to make a big difference in terms of safety. Agree. Now, occasionally you might actually go a little too high and hit the lung. And so I looked into that as well. And kind of like you were saying that you can still have complications with ultrasound. You definitely can. This study showed that when a pleural puncture was done for malignant pleural effusions with ultrasound, you still had a rate of pneumothorax a little under 1%, so 0.97. But look how much higher that rate of pneumothorax was when you didn't use ultrasound. That's pretty incredible. I hope no one's doing this without ultrasound anymore. Me too. All right, Matt. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to try and convince you why you should be using ultrasound to diagnose pneumonia. Is that, is that okay? Yeah. So quick question. How often do you think you see the physical exam findings in pneumonia? Give me like a range of percentages. You know, it'd be a fun game is if we got some other people to give guesses to. That's a great idea. 
Vicky? Haney? Mike? Other Mike? Other Mike? <laughs> I don't I don't know any other mics. Sorry. I'd say 50%. My guess would be somewhere around 25%. Oh, now you want my opinion. That's messed up, guys. What is this, like, lung podcast number 47? You know, I know a little bit more than cardiac ultrasound. I know a little bit of lung ultrasound. Like, for example, I know that uh, there's clinical exam findings in pneumonia at least between 0 and 100% of the time. Huh? How about that? I know that much. Um... Avocado. What is Denver? Wait. Lung ultrasound for pneumonia? It's gonna be huge. Um, I'm gonna phone a friend. What did Vicky say? It's a good question. You can find out at CaboFest2017.com. January 11th through 13th in Cabo, Mexico. Well, before I answer your question, let me just say that Haney guy should be on the podcast more often. He's so handsome and, and very smart, and his hair is just always so perfect. I'm gonna go with 75%. Red rum. Um, those are all great guesses. Uh, I'm gonna say between four and thirty-six percent. Oh my God, you're you're right. That's perfectly correct. How did how did you do that? Honestly, I don't. Know. Sometimes I amaze myself. I don't want to say I don't I don't want to I don't want to say I'm smarter than those people. You know, I guess so. I guess I am. <laughs> so uh, you're probably right. So how do you think X-ray does? Do you think it does any better? I'm sure it does. I get you're actually taking a look. Yeah, it actually doesn't do all that great either. Chest X-ray was reported to have a miss. Wait, wait, go rate back of, to that X-ray. I mean, go back to what X-ray? The X-ray you just showed. This one. Yeah. What is uh? What's up with that central line? You mean this one over here? Yeah, and over there. So I've literally had this in every lecture since I was a resident, and you're the first person who's commented on this weird subclavian that I did. So that takes a lot of skill to go from the left. I just all the way to the right. I just didn't want it to go down. I just didn't want it to go down here. I wanted it to go across this contralateral subclavian. It's cool. Whatever. I did it. All right. So one of the things that a lot of the studies that look at the accuracy of chest x-ray have a weird gold standard. Like they say, like, did they get lost to follow up or did they ever come back with a diagnosis of pneumonia? I think the best way to look at this is to directly compare chest x-ray to CT scan within maybe an hour or two of when both of them were taken. And these studies that I include here actually had ultrasound and x-ray and all got a CT as a gold standard. And some of these numbers I extrapolated from studies, but I think that using your CT scan is probably the best gold standard. And there's a lot of numbers here, so I wanted to simplify it for you, Matt. And look at these numbers here. I mean, these are sem sensitivities. So if you look here, the best that x-ray does is worse than the worst ultrasound does. So you really should be using ultrasound to diagnose your pneumonias, not chest x-ray. Yeah, those are some pretty impressive numbers. And um, obviously, ultrasound is not 100% sensitive for pneumonia. But this just clearly makes the point that ultrasound is more sensitive than x-ray. I guess the question, and I don't know if you're going to talk about this or not, is is it too sensitive? That's a weird thing to say, but I hear people say it. So it's probably good to address. So wait, what do you mean too sensitive? Well, I mean, we're going to be catching tiny pneumonias that probably don't need treatment, but because we usually treat pneumonia, we're used to treating pneumonia, we're going to give these patients antibiotics when we wouldn't have needed to before. Maybe the 23 to 54% that we miss with x-ray are the ones that aren't big enough to need treatment. Are we going to be over-treating now that we're finding all these smaller pneumonias? That's actually a really good point. And there was actually a pediatric study that was done recently that actually, it wasn't their primary outcome, but they actually sort of asked that question. And, I, you know, I kind of would like to talk about it in the future. So I got an idea. Instead of us talking about it now, let's continue with this. But why don't we get someone smarter, nicer, more intelligent, mm -hmm better person overall right. basically better than us at everything to talk about this with you yeah that sounds awesome we'll, we'll do it in a couple of podcasts so let's just move on here the other thing is that if you have two people that look at that same x-ray they will not agree on if there's pneumonia or not matt do you know how kappa values work uh, of course i do do you want me to explain it or are you gonna i mean i, I that's i asked you i, I mean well, I said, in general you know in general 
If you got a kappa of 0.01 to 0.2, that's kind of like a little bit of agreement, not very good. 0.2 to 0.4, we consider that fair agreement. 0.4 to 0.6, moderate agreement, and then 0.6 to 0.8 is substantial. And then if someone, if the kappa is over 0.8, then that's almost perfect agreement. So the higher the kappa, the more reliability between operators and agreement there's going to be when more than one person is looking at a test. So you want higher kappas. So you want, so you're saying you want as close to one as possible. Yes. Yeah, that's great. So let's look at how x-ray does when two different people read it. Look at these numbers here, 0.43, 0.51, 0.38. These numbers look really small next to the kappa value of ultrasound for the diagnosis of pneumonia. And what what was that number that was almost perfect agreement, Matt? Uh, One. Well, that was perfect, but almost perfect. Probably the best that we're going to get is above 0.81, and we have a 0.83 here. So much more reliable. Not only are we more accurate, but if you have two people look at that same ultrasound, they'll agree with an almost perfect correlation. Now, one thing that I heard a lot in residency, Matt, was let's give them some fluids and see if that x-ray fluffs out. Do you, do you ever remember hearing that? Um, I guess I do. More like in the floor in the ICU type thing, not really in the ED, but... Yeah, well, actually, would hear it in the ED as well. You had a patient that was kind of sick. They were maybe dehydrated, they immunocompromised, maybe the elderly, and they clinically probably had pneumonia. There was concern for pneumonia. And instead of getting the ultrasound, some people would say, well, let's just give them some fluids and see it. And I just, I remember having a hard time with this, you know, once, especially once I learned how to use ultrasound to diagnose pneumonia. You don't need to do anything special to make your ultrasound more accurate. You just need to put that probe on the patient and see that pneumonia or see the absence of that pneumonia. You don't have to have it fluff out. What does that even mean? Is that a real thing? I don't know. I don't, I've never yeah, seen it. I've never seen any literature that talks about fl- fluffing out, but I remember I've heard it. I mean, I've heard it. I do like the term though. Fluff out. Fluffing out. Yeah. It, it makes, it makes me feel like, like it's like turn down service at a hotel, like, like fluff, fluffing the pillows. Yeah. Kind of or thing. like when you're a discharge patient, you say, get the fluff out. <laughs> All right, so that was a theory. Now let's talk about how to actually do it. We're going to go back and talk about pleural effusion first. Holy crap, this is getting long. Solid stuff, but seriously, your attention span is not this long. So relax, digest, go register at CowboyFest2017.com, and then we'll be back to the how-to part in a week from now. See you then. They know that I need the right electricity to move my disco feet. They know that I need a rhythm of ecstasy to get the disco feel. Baby, give me the song that keeps rolling on along until the break of dawn. Baby, give me the one, cause we like to get it done before tomorrow comes. There, ultrasounds, hearts, lungs, my VCs. Let us know how you feel about it. Better ultrasound only needs 20 cc's of fluid to accumulate before you can actually detect it. Now, some studies even say as little as five, but I believe the 20 a little more than I believe the five. And look at this I mean, you got 75 is the best that x ray can do with special maneuvers, and ultrasound, you only need 20 cc's of fluid to accumulate before you can find it. That's to put that in the context. That's-
That is, that's a lot. That's, <laughs> that's mean, a decent amount. That's like, do you know how much a twenty? Do you know how much a twenty cc syringe is? Like that's. That's like.